This is an EGR valve. I actually have this EGR valve just sitting here as an extra part in my home garage. Do you know why? It's because, as very often happens, uh, somebody will bring a car for me to fix, but before they do, they look up the code at AutoZone or something, and in this case, I'm sure they found it had the formula P040X, where X doesn't matter, because it had the word EGR in it, and of course, they went on to the forums and chat rooms, which you know I love. It is the breeding ground for all the Swaptrons and parts clowns that, of course, told him he needs an EGR valve, which he didn't. And that is what we're going to do today. We're going to learn, as you well know, not to be like those 98% of idiots that just change parts like that. You guys, the 2%, know that there must be much more to an EGR system than just this valve. And if you are not familiar with it, uh, that is indeed the case. And you know that learning what this valve does what the EGR system does, how it is controlled, and how to test the various components, it will prevent you from making the mistake that this guy made and getting an EGR valve that you do not need. So we are not going to show you how to replace an EGR valve, of course, in this video. So right there, I know most of you guys are really ticked off about that because you want to see how to change an EGR valve. No, this is for the 2% of people that couldn't care less about that because they can look at that and see it just is two bolts and a pipe that goes through there, and they can figure that out. They're interested in learning what this thing does, how to diagnose it, and how to find what component of the system is failing so you replace only what needs to be done. It is called the Diagnosis and Understanding Series, and today it's going to be about EGR. And by the way, that 2% has grown to now 12 thousand subscribers. I am actually extremely humbled to know that there are that many people that will bypass all of the parts changing videos and how to take stuff apart and everything like that to actually do this much less savory classroom type stuff to learn about these components and learn how to do diagnosis. It's always going to be a minor subset of the greater population, but 12,000 people. I think that may be more than for uh, XM Sirius Radio right now, but it's very humbling. It drives me to make more videos. But anyway, what is this thing and what is EGR? So let's um, go ahead and get to the dry erase board of knowledge and talk about it. So EGR stands for Exhaust Gas Recirculation. And based just on context clues from that, you can pretty much assume what this valve must do. It basically recirculates exhaust gas through the intake manifold. And that is actually done on this particular valve. There are different ones, but there is going to be a uh, inlet here from the exhaust and then an outlet into the intake manifold. And basically, this is a diaphragm that is vacuum controlled. There are also electronic ones, which we'll talk about. And basically, by lifting the diaphragm through vacuum control, a little stopper is lifted up so that the exhaust goes into the intake manifold. Actually, here, I'll show you real quick. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little vacuum line here. I'm going to put the vacuum line onto the EGR valve there, and then I'm actually just going to suck on the other end. Obviously, I'd use a vacuum pump normally, but by sucking on the end here, maybe you can hear it opening and closing. And what we're going to do, I'm going to get a flashlight, and we're going to actually look at this pintle in here. Let's see if we can get a good camera angle on that. Okay, when I suck on the hose, You can see it opens and closes. All right, this kind of looks like something from a Cheech and Chong movie, I guess. But uh, obviously, the elephant in the room, why would you possibly want to do this in a car? And as is usually the case with a lot of the um, engine management components and things that would cause a check engine light, it's about emissions. So it turns out when you combust your mixture in the engine that when you look at the exhaust, there is always some unburned fuel that exits the exhaust. And of course, we know about this from other videos with catalytic converters and how they convert the hydrocarbons to CO2, water, things like that. 
But the thing is, is that before you just send those hydrocarbons through to make that conversion, wouldn't it be nice if you could recycle them? And it turns out there is a benefit to doing that. By recycling them, you get a little bit cooler um, combustion temperatures, cooler engine temperatures. And also, it, the main thing, those recycled vapors of fuel, because it's in a vapor form, happens to be extremely efficient to burn. So there is definitely some advantage to improving a little bit with your fuel economy. It's not a huge thing, but that's basically the idea to sort of recirculate some of this wasted but usable vaporous hydrocarbon emission. So let's talk about how this is controlled because you have to do this at the right times. The problem is, is doing this at the incorrect times is going to severely lean out your engine. For example, if you are at low RPM, if you're at idle, if you were to introduce these gases, you are going to basically kill the engine. And this is actually exactly the result that I look for when I do testing on the EGR system. One of the main things I'll look for is can I kill the engine at idle by activating EGR. So it's very important that you activate this exhaust gas recirculation at the right time. And it's all about how is that controlled in some cars like this one. Uh, it's, there's going to be kind of a fair amount of mechanical control on it. And then in later cars that have electronic EGR valves, it's completely electronic. There's no vacuum. There's no solenoid controlling the vacuum, things like that. Again, be aware that as usual, there are various designs of these EGR valves for different makes of cars, even different models. We are going to talk about two main ones today. This one, which most of you guys are probably going to be familiar with, and this is going to be your vacuum solenoid control EGR. There is also, of course, going to be the electronic EGR, which we'll talk about later. And also be aware that there are other EGRs out there. Uh, one of them, I believe, if I remember, it's called a positive back pressure EGR. It looks identical to this one, but it's very different. And we'll talk about that when we get to the, the point. But basically on that one, um, drawing a vacuum like we did on there does not open the pintle. So it can lead to a false diagnosis. I believe those are in like the later 80s Jeep models. I know for a fact I saw one on an 89 Grand Wagoneer one time. Don't run into those too much, but for the most part you're going to see these, but we will talk about the electronic also. So let's talk about how this EGR system works. If you understand this one, it'll actually be remarkably easy to understand the electronic one because it's much simpler. You would think after a year my drawing skills would improve at least some, but as you can see, not at all. But what we've got here is your engine. Um, of course, on the upper part, we've got the intake manifold. Um, on the bottom here, we've got the exhaust. Of course, you'll have an O2 sensor. Particularly on this uh, model of EGR valve, you're certainly going to have an O2 sensor. On an electronic EGR, you may, of course, have an air fuel sensor here. And in blue is shown our EGR system. So obviously, right off the bat, you can see our EGR valve here. There are many other components to an EGR system that could be the problem for a check engine light code where replacing the EGR valve is not the problem. And as a matter of fact, there are many cases, which I'll explain, that you find where there is nothing wrong with any of the components. There is merely a blockage in the system where clearing the blockage fixes the problem at no expense. But if we look at the exhaust here, um, on the exhaust manifold, there will be a pipe that comes off the exhaust manifold and goes to the EGR valve. And the EGR valve will normally be closed. As we can see, if the exhaust comes in to the EGR valve, it will have pretty much nowhere to go. Uh, above the EGR valve is a diaphragm shown with the dotted blue line that is controlled by vacuum. And there is a pintle here blocking the gas from going into the intake manifold. At the appropriate times, and these appropriate times are going to be generally when the car is driving and at a certain RPM. And the amount of EGR gas that you would want to get into the intake will be proportional to the RPM. So again, you don't stall out the engine. 
and that is going to be controlled pretty much by your EGR solenoid. So as we can see here, if the EGR solenoid, which is electrically controlled, and these um, electric controls can have some variance. Uh, there may be a positive at all times direct from the battery. There may be a computer-controlled positive. There may be a computer-controlled ground. But whatever the case is, the computer is going to command on the EGR solenoid. And it will have various ways of controlling the duty cycle of the solenoid, which we'll talk about. But basically, when the solenoid, which is normally, of course, closed, opens, the solenoid allows vacuum from the intake manifold to go and pass through the solenoid to the EGR valve and the diaphragm will lift under vacuum, which of course is going to lift that pintle and EGR gases can go into the intake manifold. So very simple operation. There is some, again, some concern about how much lift you would have of the pintle and when the pintle lifts up. EGR will be disabled, and you can see, by the way, that the EGR valve is entirely controlled by the solenoid, so it is more appropriate to say the solenoid will be disabled during idle. Um, it is on many cars, I know for a fact on GM cars, it's going to be disabled in either park or neutral. You have to have the car driving in order for EGR to open. And also it will not open at wide open throttle. Uh, something for the Rice Boys to keep in mind. Uh, one of the popular free mods for performance enthusiasts is to do an EGR bypass because of course the limited thinking is they don't want these hot exhaust gases getting into their intake manifolds because colder air is higher performance and that's all that they can think. Um, they don't understand that this system does not apply during wide open throttle, which would be of course during a racing application. So um, let's talk about this EGR solenoid because the EGR solenoid is actually the brains of this outfit. It is not the valve that is the brains of this particular outfit, unless you have an electronic one, but we're not talking about that yet. So for this EGR solenoid, there are a couple of different strategies that are used to control the amount of vacuum that gets to the EGR valve because obviously you want to have the correct lift of the pintle to match your engine load conditions and engine speed so that you don't stall out the engine uh, through lean condition. And we'll talk about the um, lean condition effects that you get with unintended EGR on fuel trims and stuff like that. Uh, if you're not familiar with fuel trims, don't worry, I'll refer you to a video for that. If you are familiar, we'll just go forward from there as promised. But basically, it's very important that we control the amount of vacuum. So one main way that a lot of these solenoids will do it is through a duty cycle. So basically, um, the voltage coming in can be varied or the on-off pattern can be varied so that the amount of vacuum is controlled by the computer. And of course, that's done electrically by the computer. And in a lot of these designs, uh, you may have a ground side switch from the computer only. Uh, the positive and negative can both come from the computer. Um, it's very important to know the system so that you don't fry your computer if you're doing electrical testing for command to the solenoid. Obviously, you need command to the solenoid for this all to happen. So another thing to keep in mind about these solenoids, it would seem very obvious to you that if the solenoid is closed, if you were to try to blow through the solenoid, you would not be able to blow through it. Or if you were to put a vacuum pump on either side of a closed solenoid, you should just be drawing vacuum and nothing would come through. And actually on a lot of solenoids, they, they actually don't work that way. Some do, but not all of them. And actually, I don't think even most of them. Um, what a lot of these solenoids do is they have a vent to atmosphere. So as part of the control for the vacuum, especially on a duty cycle control, a lot of the vacuum will actually be lost out to atmosphere. So even at a 0% duty cycle, or in other words, when this is off, um, if you were to try to blow through the solenoid, you actually would be able to blow through it. If you applied vacuum 
vacuum would pass through the solenoid. But the trick is, is that not enough vacuum passes through the solenoid to be strong enough to lift the EGR valve diaphragm. So in, in these systems, you might falsely diagnose a leaking solenoid, but that actually won't be the case. Now, when you, if you were to apply a full 12 volts to the solenoid, yeah, then, then you would have full vacuum, nothing lost to atmosphere. If you were to plug this end of the EGR valve and try to blow through it, you would not be able to. Same thing, plug this end of the EGR valve, put a vacuum pump onto this hose, you would draw vacuum all you wanted and, and you wouldn't lose any of it. So that definitely would be the case on a valve like that. Now, there is another strategy that you can use besides duty cycle to control this. And that would be to control the amount of vacuum that comes in. So as opposed to this design where we've got it directly at intake, you could also have some type of control here to limit or um, not so much limit the amount of vacuum coming through. And of course, in such an application, the electronic control of the EGR valve would just be strictly on and off, and the vacuum amount from the engine would be controlled. So you can have those two strategies, and it's important to know which strategy you're dealing with when you do the diagnoses. So uh, I actually don't know which one this car that we're going to look at has, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly be able to figure it out. I believe it's probably going to be a duty cycle control. So before we go to the car, let's look at the possible problems that you could have with the EGR system and how you would know those problems and how you would diagnose them. Believe it or not, the most common problem, and actually it was the one for, for this guy, the most common problem I find is carbon blockage here, where the EGR valve connects to the intake. And I will show you how to test for that, but it should be very obvious. If you were to apply vacuum to the EGR valve, we know that if you apply vacuum to the EGR valve and the car is at idle, and you introduce those EGR gases into the intake at idle, you will stall the engine out. So one very simple diagnosis, it is actually one of the first ones that I learned how to do, maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, that actually got me into this hobby and now somehow fixing cars for other people and getting very fascinated with diagnosis is when I had an EGR valve problem on my older Trans Am and I wanted to diagnose it. And of course, at the time before YouTube, uh, the asshats over on the forums were all telling me I needed an EGR valve. I wanted a way to test it. And the great way to test it is um, what happened was I applied vacuum directly to the EGR valve. And when I did, I could hear the EGR valve open, but the engine never died. And of course, when I removed the EGR valve, I found a huge carbon chunk that was blocking the EGR gases. This is actually a very common thing. I actually have a video that shows this. Um, I can't remember which one it is, but I do have a video that actually shows this exact thing. So um, you could also get a carbon blockage, of course, here or anywhere along here, but usually it's where the pintle is. It's very, very important to remember, if you have a carbon blockage, when you look at the EGR valve, the the carbon blockage would block this hole, which of course goes up to the intake manifold. However, it is critical to remember that you also want to check that hole on the intake manifold to make sure it is also not plugged with carbon because it usually is. And many times these things are located in the back of the engine where it's hard to see. So you'll want to use a mirror or something to check that. But that actually, believe it or not, the most common problem I find, especially with these older EGR valves. Now, of course, you could have any number of leaks in the vacuum here. Obviously, a leak here would also cause a lean condition on your engine because you would have a vacuum leak right here. Um, it's very clear that it would also, of course, not allow the EGR valve to open when the solenoid opens. If you have an open here, there is no vacuum. Obviously, you could have an open at this vacuum line from the solenoid to the valve. When the EGR valve is commanded open, uh, the solenoid opens, 
then of course you would have a vacuum leak here, which would of course lean your condition out um, during time when the EGR valve was supposed to be open, but you wouldn't get EGR activity. So that of course could be a problem, any number of these issues with your vacuum lines. Obviously, it goes without saying, a problem with the EGR solenoid not opening and closing. That would be a big problem. And of course, any problem where you do not have command to the solenoid because of an open or a short to ground or something like that, anything with the electrical, possibly even a computer problem. So those are your variables, and I will show you how to test for every single one of those things, and we'll do that on the actual car. But before we do, as always, one of the most important things to know is it, is it is very helpful to know many times to understand how the computer knows that there is an EGR valve problem. Because if we think about it, there's several EGR codes that you get. How does the computer know to throw those codes? And there's several codes like the, um, I think there's a 0401, which is a, a common one. I think that's the insufficient flow. How in the world on this system especially, would the computer know that there is less flow of exhaust gas than there should be based on the pinnel position? How would it possibly measure that? And then of course there are some electrical circuit codes and things. Those would be obvious. The computer clearly is checking uh, on the return line, um, you know, on the ground what the voltage is so it can check some circuitry and everything. But, but how would it know the flow is incorrect? There's a couple ways that you could know the flow of the EGR valve here. And of course, on an electronic one, one way would be you would know the pintle position exactly because they're, because it's electronically controlled. There is what actually, for all practical purposes, is a throttle position sensor uh, built in with an electronic EGR valve so that it knows the position of the EGR valve and it would know that it's not correct. Um, there is also, on a non-electronic one like this, a much simpler method that it does. And we've talked, I have a diagnosis and understanding video on the MAP sensor. So in this case, when the EGR opens and those gases come into the intake, it should go without saying if you understand the operation of the MAP sensor, and if you don't, I'll refer you to that video. It is very obvious that the voltage on the MAP would increase. So by the computer checking the MAP sensor response to the anticipated flow, it knows that there is the appropriate amount of flow. If the MAP sensor goes much higher than would be anticipated for the requested flow, then of course it would indicate too much flow or too little flow or something like that. Obviously you can see where a carbon blockage here would certainly cause an insufficient flow error because the PCM would of course command the solenoid open, solenoid opens, we get vacuum through there, pencil lifts, but there is no EGR flow through here, no change in the MAP sensor. Um, it is also, I believe, on some systems done through the O2 sensor. Obviously, you would have your O2 sensor trace going along, but if EGR gas comes through into the intake, it is going to have a leaning effect. And of course, your PCM can look and see that there is that desired effect as a result of the EGR. And then of course, with the EGR valve closing, you would go rich for a little bit. So there is validation through um, oxygen sensor response and fuel trim that the PCM could also use. I'm not positive if systems of systems that use that, but uh, I do believe that that is also a method. It certainly is a method that can be used, but on most cars that I work on, um, it's usually detected just simply through the MAP sensor. Okay, so all of this will come much, much clearer, uh, both with the repetition and with the actual visual when we look at this on a real car. So what we are gonna do is we are going to look at an actual car that uses the vacuum solenoid control type EGR, just like we went over. If you understand that, and if you can learn how to diagnose that system, it is actually easier to do an electronic one in some ways, um, both of these systems 
unfortunately, have some limitations where without a scan tool, you can run into a kind of a big problem. And I anticipate we'll actually run into this problem here because remember, to test command to the EGR solenoid, the vehicle's got to be moving. So we'll see if we can figure a way around that. But uh, let's go ahead to the car and start applying what we've learned to the actual system.